Hey, welcome everybody. My name is John Clay, VP of Threat Intelligence at Trend Micro, and welcome to my monthly threat webinar. This is uh, August of 2023, and we're going to be talking all about cloud threats. And uh, joining me today, I have some esteemed colleagues of mine, uh, Pavan Kinger, who basically runs all of our cloud research organization. Uh, and Alfredo Oliveira, who is one of our lead uh, researchers, uh, who will be going through a lot of the threats that we're seeing today um, targeting cloud infrastructures. And so we're going to get into a, a whole lot of that. Before we get started, though, just some, some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you have questions, we'll take questions at the end of the webinar here. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat or in the QA uh, option in your console. Uh, and also just note that um, after the webinar is over, you will receive an email with a link to the on-demand version if you want to share that with some colleagues. Uh, but also you'll receive the slides, uh, so you'll have a, a uh, be able to take a look at those afterwards as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Pavan and Alfredo. Uh, Pavan, why don't you give the audience just a quick background about yourself, a short one, and then Alfredo, you go after him. Sure, thanks, John. Thanks for having us here. Uh, my name is Pavan. Uh, I'm the director of uh, threat research at uh, Trend Micro, primarily focusing on cloud and container threats. My uh, other roles include managing a lot of defense, so detection and response as well, as cloud, IPS, endpoint security. So I manage a whole bunch of things, but uh, primary focus uh, is around cloud and container threats. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for having us, John. Uh, my name is Alfredo, and I work on this uh, team called Nebula. We call that internally, and we are pretty much focused on researching and trying to get ahead of bad guys on the cloud and containers aspect. Excellent. So I think we're going to have a great one. I'm going to try to keep it somewhat conversational today for you all. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, first up, we're going to talk some case studies. So obviously, we have a lot of information coming in. We actually see these uh, these cases and we look at them with our customers uh, to try to help them and uh, assess what's going on. So Pavan, why don't we get started on this first case study here? Sure thing. And the reason we decided to have a case study here in place was primarily to build up on some concepts around cloud security, what's important, what's not. So we'll use that as a segue into our deeper research, what we are seeing out there in the wild, uh, some of the ugly threats uh, in the cloud and cloud native space. So starting with this case study, there was this recent, it's very, very, very recent, it's just from July, Microsoft uh, shared details about this incident that happened uh, and, and a attack that was carried out with this threat actor called Storm 558, it's a Chinese threat actor. They, uh, Took advantage of some stolen keys and they could impersonate as any user uh, on Azure. So it's pretty serious. Uh, some of the non commercial accounts were compromised in this. Uh, that was the saving grace there. But it's it, it exposes a vulnerability in the cloud where identity is such a big piece there. And some of the keys that are supposed to grant you access to services, those keys themselves were compromised. It was pretty big, several organizations were affected. CISA went ahead and released an advisory on that. And uh, so the other interesting things you saw about this one was they, they really called out on logging. Like if you see uh, this screenshot that I have on the bottom left. Yeah, and if you dig deeper into the Microsoft and some other uh, analysis that were published on this, to be able to detect this, it's really hard because some of the Traces of this, if you, if you want to say, were only possible if you had some of the paid premium subscription login. So you have to pay extra money to get those. So <clears throat> one other issue in, uh, in the cloud is like just being able to identify a threat. So that was the other piece here. So identity, the importance of identity, managing, saving your keys, and being able to detect a certain threat. Interesting. Understand. So I, I also thought that I saw where Microsoft ended up giving away some of the access to the logs, right, to, to help their customers <clears throat> in this situation. That is correct. But that was a reaction to this threat. So I'm going to be talking about this later, shared responsibility model, what has become of it today. I think just you know, 
towards the later part of the session. Uh, I do want to dig into that, how it's spanning out, and there's some good insights there because it was all Microsoft site. In this case, the keys that were supposed to be taken care of, that they were stolen and then abused. Right. That's why in reaction, they had to enable the logging back, made it available to every customer. Gotcha. And yeah. this is another and, one that we looked at, correct? Yeah, okay. Yeah, actually, so this is kind of a segue because we actually been reporting about attackers, not only 555, Storm 558, but also all their other attackers uh, making secrets. They're very target to, to go after uh, cloud computing services. And they primarily do that because um, I, I like, I'm, we are going to talk about Toyota right now. And I like a quote from uh, one of the spokesperson that they lacked, they said they lacked uh, an active detection system on these kinds of threats, right? And um, we are going to talk more about other um, threat actors targeting cloud infrastructure, but secrets and identity is the core of most of those attacks. Yeah, it's interesting to see that mm -hmm. in the cloud, one of the biggest uh, motives is to secure an account access, right? Um, because that, that seems like one of the big things and initial things that they do when they target a cloud is really try to get access to an account, correct? Yeah, and that's a... Identity is such a big piece still, you know, commonly referred as IAM. We'll talk about that as well in detail. The IAM is really important and how your uh, IAM and the visibility into that, which kind of takes us to the whole concept of zero trust later, we'll talk about. So how those entities are being used and abused and how, how to track them, we'll, we'll touch upon that a little. But that really is the primary goal of uh, some of the attacks, some of the malware is also focusing just on stealing credentials. Right. Like this example here. Yeah, yeah, this is actually a pretty good example. And this is a real world example. And um, this is a double white sport, actually. So here you can see some screenshots we've taken uh, when we found out about this uh, hacking team called Team TNT. They were stealing, uh, they were very much focusing on AWS. So they were going after services running on AWS. And once they got a point of entry there, they would steal the credentials and use for future attacks. And we actually started following them and studying their methods and their uh, arsenal. And we could actually get access to some servers that they were keeping their stolen goods. So this is one example. So they were storing by um, targets, IP, and we could have access to that and report back to, to AWS. And by the way, so the, the title of this slide here is the title of the blog post or the white paper we wrote about. So once the guys uh, that are attending the, the webinar receive the, the PDF, they can just Google the name and they can have access to the full story where we go into much more into details. Excellent, excellent. And then one other case study I know you wanted to um, highlight is the Toyota one here. Yes, that, that, that was like a pretty interesting story because first of all, uh, this was uh, almost a decade long um, misconfiguration that was going on that, were, that was exposing pretty sensitive material. So essentially uh, Toyota has this service that allows the cars, the smart cars to connect back uh, to their infrastructure and their infrastructure runs primarily on cloud. So due to this misconfiguration, the place they were holding all the information was exposed. It was open to the public and information such uh, car uh, serial numbers, uh, footage of the integrated cameras on the cars were being stored there and it, they were open to the world. And the very heart of this was a misconfiguration on the cloud, where um, on our research, we actually see that a lot, this kind of misconfiguration where something was supposed to be private, but it's actually public due to the uh, complexity when 
a system is grow too large, it's really hard to keep track. And the, the quote from the spokesperson of Toyota really highlights that, that they were expecting privacy by default and they were lacking some active way to detect that it was an issue. Yeah, it's very interesting to see. Obviously, we'll talk later about misconfigurations, but you know, two things that we uh, take out of these case studies. One is that credentials are definitely under uh, attack and being targeted, but also misconfigurations, which necessarily isn't necessarily an uh, the the attack itself, right? It's a misconfiguration that opens a cloud um, item to the to the internet and opens it to the public, and then the the actors get access to that data obviously so we'll we'll talk we'll, we'll talk a little bit further about that um and then pavan you wanted to talk a little bit about this misconfiguration because i think don't we we have a product called conformity that actually analyzes um and and looks for misconfigurations and can can highlight misconfigurations within a a cloud environment and this is kind of what we're sharing here right yeah and it's the data from that product called conformity this is part of the cloud one portfolio so this is basically the number of scans that we run. So once you, our CSPM customers, the cloud security posture management customers, we run millions of scans for various uh, uh, resources. On the left, you have AWS and on the right, it's Azure. So it just shows like how many scans are, how many objects are there uh, or resources in the cloud specific terms, rather AWS terms. Uh, we're running millions of checks. And as a result of this, we find thousands of misconfigurations that we report to customers. So it's, it's pretty big, like misconfigurations really lead the charts um, on the toxic top cloud issues. Yeah, and I think in, in our uh, year, year long report that we published earlier this year, we looked at 2022, and I think there were many services, cloud services that had 100% misconfiguration rates by across a number of services and, wow. and all three actually, uh, Azure, AWS and even Google, um, which is, again, you know, this is a challenge for everybody, right? New technology, and it's hard to understand it and, and secure it until you really, truly understand it. And obviously, the, the malicious actors, adversaries out there take advantage yeah. of that uh, um, issue for, for their customers. So one of the things I'd like to, to, to chat, and we're going to talk about the threat research, but um, Pavan, I know... Um, you know, the, the audience may want to understand kind of, you know, how do we go about this research? What are we researching? And then also uh, maybe a little later, we talk about um, how are we obtaining this kind of intelligence and where this intelligence is coming from? So why don't you start on the, on the focus of our research? Right. And it's been years now that we've been running this team uh, with the primary focus. We literally have zero distraction policy here on this team. Uh, we, we just don't look at anything other than cloud and cloud native threats. And the, the focus here is to ensure we get a handle on what's the state of uh, security in the cloud or state of threats in the cloud. So threat hunting is a very big piece of that. We look at uh, some of the telemetry that comes back to us. We set up several honeypots to, for our threat hunting. And I'll let Alfredo talk more about that in a second. But our goals were Cloud is still a new area. Like it may sound like a bold statement here. It, it still is a new area. There's still a lot of different paradigms that need to be uh, discussed. Things are new. The nature of issues in the cloud is different. It's not like a typical vulnerability research or a typical malware research. It's super different. We're talking about permissions that shouldn't exist, the boundaries uh, discussion, should it be tenant boundary, cross tenant boundary, et cetera. So the idea was jump in with, with our research, learn more about the state of threats, come up with some, show some thought leadership by creating threat models, uh, basically help the industry, if, they, if you're doing a Kubernetes deployment, for example, or Docker, or just your yeah, serverless applications. How exactly do you model for threats there? A lot of CISOs actually find that helpful because now they can, they can look at our threat models and see what are the potential threats and how they can mitigate those even in their design phase. And then the other thing is, I want to highlight here is the assume breach mindset, which is exposing what really happens in a cloud threat, uh, cloud attack. Typically, a you know, cell service gets compromised, but the big part of 
the cloud trend that needs to be researched and that's kind of overlooked, if I want to say, is what happens to post compromise? Say somebody gets hacked into a WordPress on their EC2, what happens next? What can I do there? And that's where Alfredo and team show their magic. They, they, they expose all the possibilities, which in technical terms we call them TDPs. Hey, here's what an attacker could do. And I'll let Alfredo chime in about threat hunting and his, his research and finding new TDPs, et cetera. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the, so... Breadth, the breadth of what we're doing is quite extensive here, obviously. Yes. You know, we were one of the first ever to get into the cloud and, and secure the cloud um, with our deep security product uh, years and years ago when the cloud just started to, to get, go there. And, and I just want to highlight to the audience, you know, this is just one small piece of, of the entire Trend Micro Research organization. So, you know, Pavan's team is solely focused on the clouds and the, and the attacks going against the cloud. We obviously have other groups that look at other areas of uh, other types of threats and other areas of the infrastructure uh, that's out there and the network stack that's out there. But um, Alfredo, why don't you comment a little bit more on what you and your team does here as well? Sure, yeah. So we we always had this mentality to try to, uh, try to be ahead of the threat actors studying on them and their techniques. But even before like taking a step back, um, we try to put ourselves on their shoes and try to find ways to get into some cloud service or exploit a, a misconfiguration and try to validate that afterwards doing, during threat hunt and exposing uh, honeypots with those inefficiencies that we see, the, those weaknesses that we see and collect real world data through this threat hunt. And then uh, on the first step, when we put our like attacker hats and try to break things, we create those threat models on how things could go wrong, right? And we try to do this in a, um, a very, in a pipeline way where we show all the possibilities, even though they are not real. So we try to prove that later. And then we publish that. And uh, during the publishing, we actually, if we are publishing something about uh, AWS or Azure, we go to them and we show them and show how concerned those uh, weaknesses are. And we, even though those are not like malware or vulnerability established by the time, we try to create this channel of maybe that's a way you could improve. And if we have some, if we've done the threat hunting already and we have some proof or TTPs that this is actually happening in the wild, we can get this data back to them and say, hey, Here's what's going on. This is not a traditional vulnerability, but you should take care of that. And we've been having uh, a good success on that. So I can uh, tell uh, one, uh, uh, a good key uh, indicator of that. Uh, Maitri just recently published the container threats, uh, container, container models, and we were able to, uh, to meet 25% of the techniques to them with proof that it was happening in the wild. So through this process, so we first imagine the problems, then we put on honeypots to do this threat hunting. And then we published with them, like 25% came from our team only. That's interesting. Cause you know, um, obviously supporting MITRE and the attack framework uh, is a big one and and us able to share with them and get them to include some of these cloud attacks in the TTPs uh, that they uh, support is a big deal. So that's that uh, just tells me that. One thing you mentioned, I'd like you to expand a little bit on here, Alfredo, is you talked about honeypots. Obviously we have a lot of customers out there running our products and we get a ton of threat intelligence from that and, and live inf information, real world attacks. But but how do honeypots, uh, explain to the audience how honeypots may even give a better sense of what is happening in the wild. Sure, yeah. So those honeypots, they, they can capture a larger uh, amount of data because they are exposed to anyone, just not our customer database. And those are designed for a specific purpose. So we are not interested on, for example, um, HTTP attacks, like web server attacks that are happening on cloud. We are interested on attacks that are attacking specific cloud services or specifically uh, container APIs that, that's being 
like our core research since the beginning of this team. So if you look up on our publications, again, white papers and blogs, we have been publishing about uh, container uh, API exploitation since 2018, I guess, or even prior to that. So that's through these honeypots that are fine tuned and we actually developed the honeypots all in house to avoid uh, detection from the threat actors as well. That's also a big thing. Yeah, excellent, excellent to, to hear that. Um, one thing, you know, it's what's interesting is uh, share a little story to the audience here. We we actually have one of our our main competitors out there that um, sort of trash talks uh, Tremeco a lot about how we are an antivirus company only. We only look at viruses and malware. We only look at uh, you know the TTPs. We don't look at the 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 full breadth of what's going on and, and we don't look at actor groups, but uh, you, here you want to share a little bit more about these actor groups. And, and in fact, we are monitoring actor groups. We monitor the campaigns that these actor groups launch against their, uh, their um, victims. And, and, you know, I kind of want to blow up that, that, uh, that uh, reference that they, they, try to, to share and, and make us look like we are a company that is only interested in malware and viruses. Yeah. And yet we, our research and, and just in this area, we are looking at um, actor groups and, and their campaigns and what they're doing uh, out there. So maybe share a little bit with the audience kind of what we're, we're looking at here. So uh, before I let Alfredo go of this, I do wanna say like, I don't know why the perception still lingers around. Uh, talking about this cloud research and several other research teams that I work with, it seems that the matter is, of course, it's bread and butter for Trend Micro, but a very large chunk of our research efforts are in IoT, cloud, what's happening in OT, even automotive security for that reason. And specifically talking about micro, uh, focusing on cloud and cloud native threats, malware is a part of it, but that's maybe like, I'm just, if I was to put a number, maybe like five or 10% of all that we do uh, our research here, it's basically uh, related to something else, like how the cloud was abused, how, in fact, in one of the research that we published, and by the way, Alfredo mentioned this before, this ton of research we published here, in one of the research we just published, how the tools of the land are being used. So attacker is not necessarily creating a malware here, they're actually using tools of the land to avoid detections, all the Linux native tools, they're using, utilizing Linux, Docker, Kubernetes for that matter. So matter is just a small portion of the, of the whole game here. The, the attack is very complex. It uses native tools, uses sometimes abuse of APIs, et cetera. It's, it's, it's way more complex than just a malware. Alfredo, I'll let you chime in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's actually a, a common trend among those uh, threat actors that we are listing here, that the ones we are closely following, uh, they tend to not develop their own arsenal uh, unless it's really necessary, but they just abuse uh, native tools from uh, either Linux or from a specific cloud provider. And, and actually, one thing that was very interesting, John, uh, when we got hold on one of their servers because they, they left some parts of the server open, we actually could see some um, study material that they had where they downloaded the, the documentation from the CSP and they were learning how to use their tools against them. That, that was quite interesting. Um, and so here we have a list uh, of the threat actors that we've been following and we've been studying and publishing about. Um, Team TNT is uh, a very, very interesting case because like I said, we got hold on most of their arsenal and their study material, so we could go further on the analysis. And we have a, a, another team, another research team in Trend Micro, where they deal with the uh, law enforcement. So we could pass all the information we had on them to this team, and they could pass information to the authorities of the country. And we probably taken out Team TNT out of the, the threat actors game. So they, they quit. And since the, the time they quit, there is no uh, new features or anything published by then anymore. Um, but another thing that was super interesting is that they, at some point, they noticed themselves, the, the other groups, and they started fighting each other. 
uh, for the resources. One thing that most of those teams, except by Storm 558, have in common is that they look for profit above anything else. So they all target cloud infrastructure to maximize their whatever they are doing. For example, um, Kissing is very much known by, do, uh, by doing uh, crypto mining where they put, put their feet on. And they uh, started developing the arsenal to detect Team TNT, Outlaws, and other threat, threat actors, um, TTPs, and kill the process of those. We are going to share more about that later. Uh, but another thing all those teams have in common is they do not only target cloud, but they use cloud as well. They abuse cloud and they use cloud as their own infrastructure, either to amplify their attacks or to pivot their attacks, or to use day by day. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, you know, one of the tactics certainly is living off the land. And, and I think now what we're talking a little bit more about is living off the cloud, right? Which is a very similar concept. Basically, you're yeah. using the cloud tools against the organization that's using the cloud tools legitimately. These folks will use them illegitimately. And that's kind of the abuse of the cloud, right? Um, so let's let's look into a couple of these areas here. Um, what do we got here? Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, on the right side, you can see target target the cloud. It's a Team TNT script that we were able to download, where you can clearly see that's the second step after they get access to a cloud account. So their very first step is to create a, an administrative role for themselves and start creating users to make the persistence on that cloud. And as you can see here, they are not uploading like a malware. They are not using a rootkit to get to get privileged access. No, they are just using, um, a, in this case, AWS CLI tool to, to do that. And on the left side, it was a story we published about um, this Alibaba bucket, similar to, to S3 buckets on AWS that was compromised and it was distributing malicious shell scripts through its technography. So if you open the, the bucket, you see just a, uh, what a, is apparently um, uh, an image, a harmless image, but it's actually when you download and when you, when you open it, it's actually uh, a shell script. There's a shell script behind it that, that runs and takes over the, the computer of the person that downloads it. And interesting, interesting. Yeah, and then uh, here's another one in terms of the war on uh, miners. So cryptocurrency mining is still quite a big thing that we noticed over the last several years where they, um, you know, they learned very quickly that that uh, targeting a PC or a IoT device doesn't do a very good job at mining for them. So cloud infrastructure, cloud servers seem to be a much better option to mine uh, cryptocurrency, right? True, and much of that is because of the scalability, right? So another thing that they learned was how to spin off different accounts and spin off different resources once they get uh, access to a cloud um, to a cloud service. And then from there, they start spinning uh, EC2s or other services to crypto to do the cryptocurrency mining for them. And th this is the story I was mentioning before, where. Um, actually, that was Paul one that gave this name War of uh, uh, War of, uh, a Battle for Resources, where that actually perfectly describes what they are doing. So it, it's mostly kissing, and then Team TNT picked it up and started doing the same. But essentially, uh, when we started getting access to their their samples, we started seeing that they were actively looking for signs of infection from another group. And they were kind of acting to, to clean that up to get the resources, the computing resources for themselves only. Uh, and th that was super interesting on our case because we, by doing that, we also had access to the intelligence they had, like the, all the TTPs and all the IOCs possible. Yeah, yeah so you know th those are just... Uh, examples of that. So the IOCs that they were looking for, like pools, emails, uh, file names, or even container names, specific container names that were running, and they wanted to kill that to have the resources ex exclusively for them. 
Yeah, what's interesting here, and people should understand that once a group knows that your cloud infrastructure is open and available to them, other groups find that out very quickly. And they now and now all of a sudden they're all warring for the exact same resources of an organ of a victim. So a victim could have multiple groups now getting into their cloud infrastructure because it is available to them and it can be utilized in this in this manner, correct? Exactly. That was the point here. Pavan, you're very uh, light. You can't hear you too well. Okay. No? Yeah, that's better. Awesome. Yeah, somebody was saying uh, they were hearing an echo at my end. Hopefully this fixes it. So yeah, and, and this was the point, right? If, if I can hack into your server, somebody else can too. So that was the mindset the attackers had, that if I can get in, somebody else can also get in, and there'll be a fight for resources. So this particular malware is trying to steal everything. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So let's talk a little bit about Linux and Windows. I know a lot of, obviously, the majority of, of the attacks and threats out there today have targeted Windows and continue to target Windows. But our research and what we're starting to see is Linux is really coming on strong, correct, Pavan? Yeah, and this is not a fair representation of Linux, just to give you an idea, because this is from our Cloud One product, which manages on-prem systems as well. So the ratio in the cloud is actually a lot higher. There's a lot more Linux there, and that's where researching on Linux techniques is, is a part of the research game here that we run in our shop. We have pipelines to look at all Linux malware that's popping up. We harvest a lot of Linux malware that's not available anywhere. Like we are the first ones to see them, which, and we have some kinds of checks and uh, some kind of checks on those. Uh, so we have a full processing pipeline that checks for, hey, is it trying to do anything specific to the cloud? Is it looking for credentials? So we go very, very specific on the behavior of that uh, of the malware, and we found a lot of good, interesting techniques that they use, how what they are after. So we discover a lot by looking at some of the Linux malware. Yeah, you know, we just published a report on Linux, uh, threats targeting Linux uh, uh, operating systems. So uh, if you haven't seen that, everybody, go, you can go to our website and go to our research uh, and reports. Uh, one of the reports we just published is the Linux one. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, Pavan, because Linux also is running a lot of IoT, industrial IoT, all of that, correct? Correct, and it, it's a topic very near and dear to my heart. I've been publishing this Linux security report for couple of years. So I, this is one of the things that I like to be part of it myself. Uh, Linux, we have seen uh, the targeting IoT specifically, and we're getting into the automotive side of things too, uh, that we are seeing malware that's targeting uh, systems, uh, specifically targeting automotive companies, et cetera. And cloud specifically, we are seeing some good trends. Like if you just jump to the next slide, we are looking at some very interesting uh, trends here. For example, Web shells, it's a very common thing out there in the cloud. And when we say cloud, if you loosen up the definition a little, I'm talking about hosting providers, et cetera. So we on a very large customer, uh, they're a hosting provider. Um, the biggest problem they have is web shells. People just load web shells on their system, huge. Uh, even on systems like Virus Total that we use for research, we're seeing a lot of web shells. This is one of our, the, the Linux report you just mentioned. In that report, we highlight Web shells are actually one of the top category of malware that we find on Linux systems, huge. And then portable malware, I'll let Alfredo talk about that uh, a little why it's so popular. Yeah, we've been seeing this, this trend of uh, malware developing Rust and Go being uh, like increasing a lot on the past few uh, years, uh, I would say a couple of years. And it, it has to do with the, the way those languages are designed it pretty much, um, you, you don't need much adaptation or in Go case, you don't need any adaptation of the code to compile that for a different um, uh, operating systems or architectures, I would say. And then it makes super easy for uh, malware authors to just switch to, to those languages and write just once, just one code, compile that for a whole sort of uh, operating systems or different architectures on the same operating system, which is the case of most of IOTs that use ARM architecture. 
So it's literally just a flag on the compilation and then you have it. And another trend that we've been seeing is that those SAM malwares being developed with the uh, aim and being tailored to steal credentials. And in order to steal those credentials, they are able, they, they are aiming to run on the developer's machine, also on the servers that hold credentials on um, unencrypted um, files, variables that, that are exported globally, and they can have access to that and exfiltrate back to their um, C2s. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, because I remember a number of years ago, Pavan, you and I were having a chat about about the cloud. And one of the questions I had asked you is, who who would you target if you were a, a hacker and targeting yeah, an organization yeah. cloud? What kind of person would you target? And you mentioned developers. Maybe you could expand a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah that was something I remember that. We even put that in our predictions uh, a while ago, years ago. Developers would be the target. That's what we said back then. And now we're seeing this becoming more of a reality. Us and other vendors are also seeing the same thing. Because your developers, the key, and towards the end of this session, we we'll talk about the four Cs of the cloud, the code cluster, et cetera. Who writes the code? The developer, right? So they, they're not just writing the application code. They're writing the cloud formations there, the terraforms of the world those end up becoming the infrastructure. So it's the, if I target a developer's machine, I can actually get access to all, basically I can infect the infrastructure right from the code, right? So it's very interesting why developers are becoming a target. We saw, uh, what was that? Last pass, same thing happened. Uh, it was a developer who was targeted, a third party person, I guess, or an employee. <clears throat> but it was a developer that was targeted. So. That's the whole deal there. Why would you target a developer? Well, it's no, it's I'm interesting just... because you know we we talk about we talk about in adding security to the entire software <clears throat> development life cycle, right? And and yet that's what the 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 adversaries are looking to do is start at the beginning of the life cycle, which is the developer. So sure, if I can yeah. introduce uh, a you know a an exploit or something and get get access at that at that layer, um, at that beginning stage, then it goes across to the ending stage, which is their customers, unfortunately. Right, and the other target is developer or their build systems. So it's developers yeah. and build systems. It's the other target there. Yeah. Let's talk about zero days. You know, I just mentioned exploits and, and this is an interesting one because we always talk about zero day exploits or zero day vulnerabilities. But you, but in the title of this slide, you talk about zero day issues in the cloud, not exploits or not vulnerabilities. What do you mean by issues here? And then let's talk about the zero day initiative and our bug bounty program that that is um, and how we're able to to ob obtain a lot of these things uh, issues that we're seeing. Yeah, it's, it's actually super interesting. We call it issues. Uh, I just labeled that on purpose because using the term vulnerabilities in the traditional sense. It just doesn't apply. Like you can't just lift and put that sticker on on a on a new cloud issue. The cloud threats are different. Some of the issues we are seeing are not even defined in this traditional CWE common weaknesses and exposures. So we, we just like to call them issues, not vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities where I can actually go and in a traditional sense probably achieve information disclosure or uh, remote code execution, etc. In some of the cases here, we're talking about bugs where hey, I was able to execute this outside of my tenant boundary, or you know, if John and I are both writing a common Jupyter notebook, uh, can John actually see my credentials, uh, my tokens there? That was one of the issues we reported recently. So they are very different cross tenant exposure, et cetera. I think we are, when I said earlier that we're still, this, this field is growing, especially we need some industry-wide initiative, and I'm very happy to share that we're working closely with Microsoft, especially on this. They're more than happy to chat about the nature of these threats, et cetera. They published a bunch of threats, and they were like, yeah, we need to talk more about this. And at Black Hat, we had those conversations. So that's why I call them issues, because we need to, as an industry, we need to put some effort here to actually label them, uh, in fact, talking about how do we Right, the severity of these bugs, et cetera. So it's a new paradigm, and we'll, we'll go into more details in a bit. Uh, 
Yeah, but uh, one inch, one challenge you have, obviously, is if we don't define it as a CVE, in a lot of cases, that means the 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 vendor who's affected by this may not. Uh, choose to fix a problem because there's nothing defined as an issue, so to speak, right? Because I know yeah. numerous times with our zero day initiative, if, if we we submit a bug to them and and if they come back and say we're not going to fix it, we still get a CVE issued and we and we actually disclose that there is a bug. Um, with this kind of thing, if there's no CVE defined, it's going to make it very difficult. And I think that's why we say that the painful journey to get them fixed, right? Yeah, it's, it's still quite a process working with CSPs to get them fixed. And there's beyond CSPs issues as well, like issues we're finding in, in code. Uh, but let's not go there. Just, just working with CSPs, it, quite often we end up in conversations like, hey, I think this is the right boundary here. Versus we may say, no, it has to be a very tight boundary. It shouldn't be even out of the VNet, for example. They may say, no, within the tenant is OK. And there's no right guidelines here to tell me what's the right. So it's basically a heavy discussion that's needed. Uh, we just got talking after Black Hat, and I hope we come up with some resolutions there, some definitions Good. there. Good. Uh, Did you need to talk about this the, measure? Very, very quickly about the Zero Day Initiative, I do want to point out that the Zero Day Initiative program uh, happily accepts bugs in uh, in the cloud and cloud native space. We have a targeted incentive program as well. But so there is the external researchers that we source bugs from, and then from micro researchers like my team, we also channelize everything through the Zero Day Initiative. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. and just before we move on, I would just like to shout out one of our researchers in the team, Nitesh, and if you you guys are interested on zero days he actually just uh, talked on black hat and he he was talking about zero days that he found on azure which is super interesting yeah this was yeah. rated as one of the top four talks at black hat this year the the one on the bottom left is for exploring yeah. security challenges in microsoft azure yeah excellent excellent um, so you know there's been a lot of paradigms over the years in in security cyber security one of the big ones we've always dealt with, in, for example, is, you know, let's go with the best of breed uh, layered model. So you have the best of breed products at all the different layers. We're starting to see some challenges with that because these these layered, these, these best of breed products in a lot of cases don't talk to each other. They don't communicate. They don't collaborate. And it makes it difficult for organizations because the threats are now, you know, across the entire organization. But let's talk a little bit about paradigms with the cloud. I know um, there's a couple of things you guys wanted to chat about here in terms of a reality check around what really is, is, is paradigms in the cloud. Um, yeah, I'm just going to pick uh, some of them here. And it, it's actually interesting, and the kind of stuff that I was just talking about, definitions of severity, for example, how severe this bug should be. You cannot apply the traditional definitions of CVS as 3.0 and 3.2. We basically need something more contextual. So that's, that's a segue into here, the, this thing here, some of the realities in the cloud when we talk about threats in the cloud. Multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, uh, it's still a very big reality here because we're seeing threats that cross over from the cloud boundary into the data centers and the other way around as well. We are seeing activity that crosses, say you're in AWS shop and uh, you're in Google shop as well. Attackers are looking at ways to penetrate, like once they penetrate into one, they're looking for ways to laterally move across into the other cloud as well. And we mentioned earlier about the Storm 558 story about um, the Microsoft issue there, detection and response. Even one of the bugs that Alfredo just mentioned, uh, we talked about that in the Black Hat, uh, in our Black Hat talk. One of the issues we reported was just lack of visibility there. Hey, once I found this thread, the attack just goes on. And once everything is done, uh, I access this resource from outside on the internet versus accessing it within Azure. There's nothing that tells me that there's an, somebody using my credentials from outside of the Azure boundary or my tenant boundary for that matter. So detection, logging, et cetera, is another level of issue because you only have visibility based on what the cloud provider tells you, right? You don't have any of your own controls there. So that's another one. Uh, 
uh, I think I've talked enough about the security boundaries, and I am we're going to address that separately. But I do want Alfredo to touch upon the zero trust. He's been championing that a lot in the industry. Yeah, especially like zero trust applied on, on cloud, which is a, I think it's the, the concepts are pretty much the same, but the considerations you have to have to apply it, it's, it's a little bit different because we, we are throwing a lot of abstraction into the mix and depending on the, on the service and depending on what you were building on top of cloud, the shared responsibility model actually shifts. Right, so when you do the absolute abstraction, and we are using uh, serverless, for example, you as the the developer or the owner of, of the service, you have so little visibility on that, and you have to to care about only your code. So, it, it, which is really hard to to follow all the checks and apply zero trust. So you have to be uh, to mitigate the risks super carefully and we've, we've I, I serverless is super dear to my heart i really like it and I, I like to research about that and when i go to open public um uh, projects and i see the the trust between the services to make it able to work it, it's really crazy and scary how trust is implied on services talking to each other on Pawan's point on multi-cloud, a service talking to uh, a different uh, data center and a different location. It, it's, it's sometimes it's really scary. And I would like to, to yeah, I wrote a piece about that. I was like, it's a little bigger than a blog post, but uh, applying, it's a double-edged sword because, because of those uh, abstractions, sometimes for containers, for example, we can achieve zero trust way easier than traditional uh, computers because you, you can access to all of the engines that are working there. But on cloud, it, it starts a little bit different. So many objects, more attention and more focus to, to achieve that. And um, yeah, so I, I think it goes hand to hand to the shared responsibility when it, it, it shifts and shared responsibility seems to not be actual, the, actually the best model as of now, I think we are slowly shifting to shared faith, which is a topic that Poland uh, is very passionate about nowadays. And if you want to, to, to talk about that, Poland. I can I can talk about that for hours. Uh, maybe <laughs> I do want to give full credit to Anton uh, coming up at this term, Anton Chalkin at Google. Pretty good, uh, very nice way to present it, shared faith. What's really become of it is shared responsibility Theoretically, sounds good on the slides and all, but when you talk about reality, it's basically shared fate. If something happens, uh, there's an incident, it's basically the CSP loses reputation, and at the same time, the customer is losing everything. It, it has to be a lot more tightly ingrained, and just in the interest of time, I'll keep it brief, but th there are issues that need to be fixed at the CSP end, but there are repercussions that a customer might have. Hey, how do I know if I was affected or not affected by this issue? Can I at least put a check mark that yes, I did my due diligence to check my logs? Where are the logs? What should I be looking for? Was I affected? And so there's a lot that we as an industry need to work on uh, to, to define this responsibility model. It has to be more of like working together uh, and own a little more than just saying, hey, everything else is your responsibility and most of what happens is on the consumer side. No, I disagree with that. Interesting. Let's, you, you mentioned IAM a lot, uh, identity yeah. access management. Let's talk a little bit more further about this. Obviously, accounts are being targeted tremendously in, in, uh, from the, the adversaries out there. Let's talk a little bit about this. Yeah, and this is something, uh, I want to say I am privilege creep. Everybody's familiar with that. That's that's actually a root of a lot of problems, like just not controlling privileges, et cetera. Again, going back to Black Hat, there was a talk by somebody there. He talked about how do you graphically see the permission creep, and there was another tool that was released just around how complex I am is on AWS, for example. So you have permissions on resources, you have permission you inherit by being part of the group, you have permissions that you're assigned to yourself directly. 
how do you even calculate the net sum of it is that complex of a thing but it's possible to reduce it and there were some interesting insights from this person at black hat hey look at something that's not being used in the last 60 days keeping a very good eye on these permissions uh, you need to really control the pri privilege creep employees leaving services being discontinued uh, rotating those tokens etc it's um, it's really important and one of the other issues I want to highlight here is with IAM, there's a lot of machine identity that are using IAM. It's not just humans, right? It's not just you and me there. So how do you control those identities and keeping an eye on the activity from those by keeping a very good uh, like hot side on, on your cloud trail events, for example? It's, it's super important to have a good mechanism to see what's happening. Yeah, this is 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 quite interesting. Uh, certainly, this is affects not just cloud, but all areas of a business. Obviously, we're seeing yeah. the the malicious actors target privilege, uh, accounts, whether it's your uh, domain account, whether it's a, a, a database account, whatever it might be. So, right. let's let's talk. You mentioned four C's earlier, uh, Pavan. Let's talk a little bit about this now. Yeah, actually, no discussion about cloud. Cloud is not just. Isolated thing, right? We talked mostly around the infrastructure side, like cloud as an infrastructure provider uh, from that perspective. But what's really happening with the cloud is so the first version of the first wave on the cloud was the cloud adoption, I want to say, was around lift and shift. Hey, okay, it's easy to get a server on the cloud. Let's just move this workload to the cloud. The reality now is a lot of that compute and new application development is actually shifting to the cloud. And your developers just build on the cloud and deploy on the cloud and even write code on the cloud. All that is part of the, the no, so no discussion is complete without the four C's. We need to ensure the secure of the cloud. And as I mentioned earlier, code, infrastructure as code is a thing now, and it's becoming more and more real and more prevalent. So your infrastructure is built off of some code, like a cloud formation or terraforms, they are building the code. We're seeing some attacks where this code itself is targeted. And once you control the infrastructure, how about just spinning an extra node on my Kubernetes cluster, right? And then keep running it as a sidecar. And just as an example, so it's very complex systems. We need to ensure we are making sure our code is being scanned. The infrastructure as code scanning has to be there, making sure there's no rogue containers running. This my cluster is. There's integrity in my cluster. There are no rogue pods, nodes running. Uh, that's what collectively makes uh, makes the whole new CNAP that we talk about. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, this just shows the complexity. And whenever there you you in, have complexity, there's going to be gaps. There's going to be challenges to deal yeah. with that. So, um, you know, the nice thing is that uh, you know work with your security vendors who can probably help you with a lot of these different areas. So let's, uh, I know we're running out of time and, and I know folks may have some questions for us. Um, what are the final takeaways that you can give the audience here, Pavan and, and uh, Alfredo? Yeah, maybe you can start and, and Paul wraps that up. So I think I, I've been advocating to this idea and to keep it alive that threat actors are actively making their journey to the cloud either to target cloud or to use cloud for their own benefit. And we are seeing multiple examples of that. So they target cloud, they use compromised, compromised account, accounts to do the have lifting for them. And this is becoming a thing. And we are seeing very specific threat actors doing that now, uh, threat groups. But I think this is a trend that others are going to follow as well. So they are following our journey. Um, and I just to, to talk about misconfigurations, we've seen uh, misconfigurations have been the very much core of the, the breaches we've seen so far. And this is uh, misconfiguration sometimes carries this uh, lighter word, like it's, it's not as bad as a malware, it's not as bad as a vulnerability, and that has to be washed away. Like misconfigurations. In, in a cloud scenario is as bad as a vulnerability, as bad as a malware uh, uh, takeaway. Yeah, yeah. And talking about the Azim breach scenario, that's one of the key 
take away one the audience to take with them because when i say don't i don't literally mean it that as you read you want to think from a perspective the message here is when you say as you breach think of what can happen after an attack uh, occurs so first of all you need an initial entry so it's an insider job or an outsider gains access to your ec2 or your lambda or any service uh, from outside after the initial compromise what is it that the attacker can do and if you practice some hygiene there like especially the permission creep for example uh, super important to control that if you control that in our research we have found the lower the permissions that you have there you can control the later impact of what can potentially happen uh, several techniques that may not occur using uh, very lightweight uh, images for your containers, for example, like distro less, keep as little as possible there. If you don't have like more than even the LS command on your containers, the attacker is like, they're going to give up. So keeping that basic hygiene really helps. So if you have the assume breach mindset that yes, that will happen, and how can I prevent them from actually doing anything harmful to you? How can you limit that? Practice that basic hygiene. Yeah, excellent points, uh, guys. And, you know, open it up to questions. Uh, one question um, I have is we talked a lot about the attacks themselves and what they are. We didn't talk a lot about what the end game is. Now, cryptocurrency mining was one that we talked about, but what are some of the end games? So if, if and you just mentioned this, Pavan, to think about, you know, your assume breach, what are they trying to do, get out of breaching the 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 cloud in these in a lot of these attacks? What are some of the the takeaways there? Yeah, so we are seeing uh, data theft is a very important uh, uh, reason that they attack the cloud. Sabotage is another reason why entire companies being wiped off uh, because somebody has compromised them. That the other one, cryptocurrency mining, was a very big use case we were seeing the last couple of years. It still is. Uh, AWS and Azure have good checks and balances for that, but on other clouds, we're seeing it's still there, cryptocurrency mining. Alfredo, do you want to chime in and share some of that? Yeah. yeah, so uh, another one that is actually big because uh, not only corporations are moving to, moving to the cloud, but also government. So Storm 558 was actually looking for espionage, right? So they were actively targeting governments uh, uh, that that was their end goal. Interesting, interesting. Well, listen, I haven't seen any other questions, guys, and I know we're just about at the end of the day. Um, so uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Pavan and Alfredo, I want to thank both of you for helping me out today and sharing your sure. um, expertise and and what you've been seeing around the uh, the world and in the world of cloud. So thanks, guys, for helping out. No problem. It's a pleasure being here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Excellent. And listen, everybody, thank you for joining me. As I mentioned earlier, you will receive an email that will have a link to the on-demand version of this, uh, as well as a copy of the slides uh, that we used today. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for joining me. And I wish you the best of luck out there. And uh, Take advantage of uh, chatting with your security vendors around the cloud. We'd love to talk to you as a vendor of cloud security ourselves. So uh, give us a ring and we'll try to help you out. Uh, everybody take care and we will call it a day.